So you're thinking of building yourself a PC, but you're not so sure where to start. Well, you've definitely come to the right place. The guys at CCL Computers have hooked me up with all these parts to make a complete guide to building a PC. So today I'm going to be showing you step by step how to put all these parts together to come up with a fully working PC by the end of the video. Once we put everything together, I'll be showing you how to install Windows 11. Any programs and drivers we're going to need to get our PC up and running. I'll show you how to install the RGB software and give you a demonstration of how it works. Then I'll show you how to enter the BIOS. If our motherboard needs a BIOS update, I'll show you how to do that. Then I'll show you how to overclock the RAM and adjust the fan curves. Then at the end of the video, I'll be doing some thermal testing and benchmarks to give you an idea of the performance you can expect from this PC. So just before we get onto the parts I've chosen for today's build, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how this video came about. So CCL Computers, which is an online computer store in the United Kingdom, got in contact and asked, would I be interested in making a step-by-step -step build guide for them? They told me, go onto the website, pick out whatever components you want, and make one of your usual build guides. Importantly, they didn't give me any restrictions over what components I could use. It was to be my choice, and they didn't ask me to say anything about their company in the video. I am going to say a little bit about CCL Computers, because although I get a lot of parts sent to me for free, I still do need to buy some components, and CCL would be one of the places I go to when I'm looking for PC components. I've always found them to be very well priced, and if I've ever had any problems with the components, they've been very quick to sort them out. So I can most definitely recommend them. So I can probably guess what a lot of you are thinking right now. If CCL have told me to go onto their site and pick out whatever components I wanted, how come I don't have a 39 days sitting in front of me? Now, I would have great fun making that build guide and using that computer, but I don't think it would be the most interesting build guide for you guys, because how many people building their first or second PC build it with high-end components? And what I have tried to do is pick medium-end components that I think you should actually build with, and as I go through the parts, I'm going to be giving you some options where you can either go up or down on those components, depending on your own budget and demands. So let's go ahead and take a look at the parts I've chosen. For the case I've gone with Fantex's P500A and I've got the DRGB version. This version comes with three 140mm ARGB fans pre-installed at the front. If you prefer, the case is also available in white and there's also a version of the case that comes with standard fans without any ARGB on them and you'll find links to all those options in the description. Moving on to the CPU, as you would expect, I've gone with one of Intel's new Alder Lake CPUs, the i7-12700K. This is a 12-core CPU featuring Intel's new hybrid architecture, so it contains 8 performance cores and 4 efficiency cores. So this CPU will not only be great for gaming, but also for productivity. If you want to save yourself a little bit of money and are happy to drop two of those performance cores, you can go with the i5-12600K. Alternatively, if you want to go for a more high-end build, you can go with the i9-12900K, which is a 16-core CPU. For the motherboard, I've gone with MSI's Z690 Tomahawk, and the big reason for choosing this board is simply the Tomahawk boards are one of my favourite boards of all times. I've used them throughout a number of different platforms and different generations, and always been really impressed with both their looks and their performance. One of the big things you need to consider when going with a Z690 board is whether you want to go with DDR4 or DDR5, and my recommendation would be to go with a DDR4 board. Um, in terms of price to performance, it's definitely going to be favourable, and the other big thing is you can't actually buy DDR5 at the moment despite it being released, and it is going to be incredibly overpriced when it's first available. So a DDR4 board would be my recommendation, and a Tomahawk is a really solid board. In terms of RAM, I've got 32GB of Kingston Fury based RGB at 3600MHz. Again, if you want to save yourself a little bit of money, and if you use your PC mostly for gaming, you could go with just a 16GB kit, and I'll put a link to that kit in the description. Um, my recommendation would be to go for the 32GB kit. It's not actually that much more expensive, and as well, it's going to future-proof your PC a little bit as well. In terms of storage, I do recommend going for at least two drives for any build. What I tend to do is have a lower capacity drive I install the operating system on, and then a larger drive which I use for the games library, or any video files if we're doing video editing. The reason I recommend this is if you go for just one drive and you end up filling that drive up with lots of games, or if you're actually using it for video editing and there's lots of reading and writing going from that drive, it can affect the operating system running. 
If you have the operating system on a separate drive and you're using that other drive and filling it up, it won't affect the running of your operating system. So for this particular build, I've got two NVMe M.2 drives from Kingston. For our operating system, I've got a 500 gigabyte drive and it's their blistering fast Fury Renegade drive. For our games library, I'm going to be using their NV1 drive, which is a Gen 3 drive in 2 terabyte capacity. So obviously if you don't need this amount of storage, you can definitely reduce the capacity and I'll put some links to smaller capacity drives in the description as well. But I would recommend sticking with the two drives. An alternative option would be to replace that second drive with a mechanical hard drive. And you'll probably save yourself about £100 by doing that. The downside of that is it's going to be older technology, which is going to actually probably be one of the noisiest components in the system and it's more likely to fail. Um, your game load times are also going to be significantly quicker with the M.2 drive. So you're just going to have to weigh those up. If I was building a PC, I would most definitely go with the M.2 drive. But again, that's going to be affected by your budget. Some of you may well be wondering why I haven't included a SATA SSD as an option. But actually, this second Gen 3 drive is actually a similar price to a SATA drive. And is going to be significantly faster than the SATA drive and easier to install. So that's the reason I'm not listing a SATA drive as an option. Keeping our CPU cool, I've got an air cooler from BeQuat. It's their Dark Rock 4. So I am a big fan of BeQuat coolers. I think they look great. They do a great job of cooling and all at fairly low noise levels. The particular cooler I've gone with has a TDP of 200 watts, so it should be fine for cooling our i7. However, if you do go with an i9, I would recommend a 360 millimeter IO. There is space for that at the top of this case, and I'll put a link to a 360mm AIO in the description that I would recommend, and also a link to a video that I've made of installing that particular AIO. So you shouldn't have any problem doing a slight modification to the build guide if you want to go with that. No matter which of the cooling options you go with, you are going to have to pick yourself up a separate mounting bracket from Bequat for the new LGA 1700 socket. At the time of making this video, the existing stock of coolers that retailers have don't include this bracket because obviously this is a brand new socket for the 12th gen CPUs. Um, as that gets sold out and new stock comes in from the manufacturers, that bracket will be included with the coolers. It's not a big problem. If the cooler you get doesn't have the bracket, you can go onto BeQuad's website and they'll send you one for free. And again, I'll put a link to that in the description. Powering our whole build, I've got an 850 watt gold fully modular power supply from Fantex. It's their Revolt Pro. The big reason I've gone for this particular power supply is the P500A has a cutout at the front down at the bottom where the power supply is going to be on full view. And I think the Fantex power supply is going to look great in the Fantex case. You don't, of course, have to go with this particular power supply, but a word of caution, be aware your power supply is going to be visible at the bottom. So again, some of the power supplies have different text on different sides. Some of them you install in the bottom, you might have the side that just has all the specifications and it's going to look absolutely awful. So my advice, if you do want to go with something different, go onto the manufacturer's website, look at the orientation the power supply is going to be in and see what's going to be visible at the front. Don't just pick your power supply and then get a shock when it looks awful down at the bottom. For the graphics card, I've gone with the 3070 Ti and the model I've got is the Phoenix from Gainward. Now, I do think it is important to point out that this particular model of graphics card is the only thing in this entire parts list that wasn't my first choice. Um, and if you're thinking of building yourself a PC, you've probably worked out that graphics cards are an incredibly short supply at the moment and you're probably going to have to go with what's available rather than what is actually your first choice, just like me. Now, I haven't used a Gainward card before, but actually on getting this site, I am quite impressed with its looks and on checking out the reviews, it is a well-performing card. Um, again, if you want to adjust your budget slightly, depending on your demands, you can drop the card down to a 3060 Ti or a 3060, or again, go up to a 3080 or a 3090, depending on your budget and your requirements. And as long as you stick with one of those NVIDIA cards, um, installing the drivers is going to be exactly the same and following along with the build guide shouldn't really be that much different. The only thing that might change slightly is the number of PCIe cables that you're going to need. So again, check your power supply has enough of them. And installing the RGB software might be slightly different. Um, if you want to follow this guide from start to finish, I would recommend getting the same card. 
In terms of case fans, as we've mentioned, this case comes with three ARGB fans already installed at the front. I have picked up a triple pack of the same fans in 140mm size. I'm planning to install two of them at the top and one of them at the rear. If you are planning with a 360mm AIO at the top, I would recommend just getting the single fan for the rear. And again, I'll put a link to that single fan in the description as well. The final part for today's build is some white cable extensions from Fantex. This last part is completely optional. It won't do anything for the performance of your PC, but in my opinion will significantly increase the looks. And as this kit is relatively cheap, I would recommend it. Okay, that's all the parts. Let's get on with the build. The first thing I do in any build is to prepare the case. By that I mean remove any panels, dust filters or anything else that's going to get in our way during the build. So our tempered glass side panel is a door. We can actually pull it and open it at the front. And then to remove the door for the build, all we need to do is lift it up and away. To remove the other side panel, all we need to do is loosen the thumb screws at the back. Then we can simply pull the panel backwards and lift away. To remove our front panel, all we need to do is pull it away at the front. With the panel removed, you can see our three 140mm ARGB fans that are pre-installed in the front. Because they're pre-installed, we're not actually going to need to remove the front panel for our build, so I'm going to go ahead and put it back in place. At the top of the case, we've got a removable magnetic dust filter. All we need to do is simply pull it away. At the bottom of the case, we've got another removable dust filter. It simply pulls out from the back and provides filtered air for our power supplies intake fan. We're not actually going to need to remove this for the build, so I'm just going to leave it in place. The reason for removing it was to show you how to take it out, but you are going to have to clean it. We're also going to need to remove this bracket at the back, which gets secured to the back of our power supply. It's held on with two thumb screws, so we'll go ahead and loosen these up. So what we're actually going to do, we're going to secure this to the back of our power supply. We're going to slide the whole thing in at the back and then tighten the thumb screws up to secure our power supply in place. In the main body of the case, we've got our accessory box. I'll show you what's inside it now. So this is what's contained in our accessory box. We've got two hard drive cages. Again, as we've mentioned, we're not going to use these for this particular build. We've got a vertical GPU bracket. Um, if you do want to use this, you are going to have to pick up a separate riser cable. Again, we're not going to use that build. We're going to install our graphics card horizontally. We've got our instruction manual. We've got a whole collection of screws, and it's great to see these come in a plastic box all individually separated out. We've got some cable ties for cable management, and we've got a GPU support bracket, which is used in the horizontal position, so I'll show you how to use this later on. We're now ready to start work on our motherboard, and we're going to do as much work as we can while we've got the motherboard on the table before we put it into the case. So we're going to go ahead and install our CPU, our M.2 SSDs, our RAM, and in fact our CPU cooler, all before we put the motherboard into the case. We're going to make a start with our CPU, and just before I open the socket up, I want to point out this little triangle in the bottom left-hand side of the socket cover. We're going to help use this triangle to orientate our CPU in the socket the right way round. So there's going to be a similar mark on our CPU, which I'll point out in a minute, and it's going to need to line up with the bottom left-hand corner. To open the socket, all we need to do is push this little lever down and away, and with it opened, we can then lift the socket cover backwards. This is our CPU, and there's two things I want to point out. If you look at the bottom left-hand corner, you'll notice there's two triangles in it, so we're going to line it up this way in the socket. The other thing you'll notice is I'm holding the CPU by the sides, and that is because I don't want to get anything on the gold contacts on the bottom of the CPU. Okay, so with the gold triangle at the bottom left-hand side, I'm going to lower our CPU down into the socket. Then all we need to do is go ahead and close the cover, and as I apply a little bit of pressure here, what will happen is the black cover will pop off. So don't be alarmed by this. And then all we need to do is close this little lever down. And we've now installed our CPU. What's important is that we don't throw this black cover out. We're going to need to put it back on if we ever remove the CPU to protect the pins in the socket. So the best place to keep this is in the motherboard box. We're now ready to install our M.2 SSDs, and as you can see from the numbers here, 1, 2, 3, and 4, this motherboard will accommodate 4 M.2 SSDs. Now importantly, all these sockets aren't created equally. Three of them support Gen 4 speeds, so that is 1, 2, and 4, whereas the third one only supports Gen 3 speeds. The other important thing to factor in, it's only the top one that goes directly to the CPU. The other three go via the chipset. So for us, we should put our fast Gen 4 drive into slot number one, 
and our Gen 3 drive will put into slot number 3, which means we're going to have two more slots available in the future should we wish to add a Gen 4 drive in. OK, so we'll go ahead and remove the heat sinks. This is our M.2 SSD and we've got gold contacts over to the right hand side which is going to go into the slot and we've got a little gold semicircle which we're going to secure to the motherboard with. So we're going to secure our drive to the motherboard using this little plastic clip. To open the socket we just need to turn the little bit of plastic all the way to the left hand side. Then I can go ahead and take our drive, inserting it into the socket at a slight angle. Once I'm happy it's all the way in, we just need to go ahead and flatten the drive down. And then we just need to turn this little clip anti-clockwise so the plastic slides over the top of the drive, securing it into place. Just before we put the heatsink back on, it's important we remove the plastic protection from the back. Then we can go ahead and lower the heatsink down into place. We're going to install our second M.2 SSD in this socket here. Again, it's just a matter of inserting into the socket at a slight angle. And what you'll notice this time, there's no actual clip in this socket. But when we flatten our drive down, you'll notice that the screw that holds the heatsink on is also going to secure the drive in place. So again, I'm going to remove the plastic protection before use. We're now ready to install our RAM. Looking at our motherboard, we've got four RAM slots, but only two sticks of RAM. And that's not a problem, as we've got a little code on the motherboard that tells us if we've only got two sticks of RAM, we should occupy the second and fourth slot along from the CPU. So I'm going to go ahead and open the clips on both sides of the RAM slot on the second and fourth slot. This is our RAM. You'll notice we've got gold contacts down at the bottom, which are going to plug into the motherboard. And importantly, you'll also notice they're not of equal length. The one of which the right-hand side is longer than the one at the left-hand side. So it's important we install the RAM in the socket on the right orientation. So to install our RAM, all we need to do is line it up with the socket. Once we're happy, everything's in place and important it's in the right orientation. All we need to do is apply some firm pressure to the top of the RAM. It's going to clip into place and the clips on both sides will close. Same thing with our second stick. Line it up with the socket on both sides. Again, once we're happy, things are in place, some firm pressure and it will click and install in place. We are now ready to assemble the backplate for our CPU cooler. Importantly, we are going to use the separate bracket from the LGA1700 kit, not the one in the box. So we just need to feed this little standoff through the outer corner. Um, there is two holes here, and it's the outer one that we want to feed it through. And then we want to take one of these little rubber washers and push it over the top, securing the standoff into place. And then it's just the same thing for each corner. Then all we need to do is line the back plate up with the holes in the back of the motherboard. And then we just need to put one of these spacers onto each corner. At this stage you're going to want to check down the bottom of the cooler box to get your B-Quad screwdriver out. This is a really nice screwdriver, it's quite long and has a magnetic tip and you're going to find it really useful for the rest of the PC build. And then we can go ahead and gently tighten each of these up. Then we've got one of these little brackets to fit on each side. Importantly, the little pointed corners go towards the middle of the motherboard. So we'll go ahead and line them up and then secure them into place. Again, all the screws come in the LGA 1700 kit. Next, we need to apply some thermal paste to the CPU. My preferred method is to add a pea-sized amount to the centre of the CPU. And importantly, thermal paste is included with the cooler. Just before we install our CPU cooler, we need to remove the plastic protection from the cold plate. And then we've got this little bracket, which we're just going to have to slide in and underneath. And then it's going to secure the cooler to the bracket we've already installed to the motherboard. We can then go ahead and lower our cooler into place, lining the brackets up. And then we can secure the bracket into place using the long screws. So I'm just putting it loosely on this side. And then again, just loosely on this side. Once we're starting to get a little bit of tension, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give each side a couple of turns. Next, I'm going to go ahead and lower our fan alongside the heatsink. And then we've got these little metal clips, so I'm just going to slide one through 
each of the holes on the fan. And then to secure the fan to the heatsink, all we need to do is apply a little bit of pressure here and here, and the clips will clip onto the heatsink. Okay, same thing at the other end. We'll put the little clips through the fan, and then again, it's just a little bit of pressure here and here to get the clips to go onto the heatsink. Then at the top of the motherboard, we've got two fan headers. The first one is for the CPU fan header, and the next one is the pump header. So we're obviously gonna plug into the CPU fan header, the fan on the heatsink. So just a matter of lining it up and pushing into place. And then we're just gonna tuck the excess cable in and out of the way behind the heatsink. Just before we get the motherboard in the case, I want to point one thing out. You will notice that the fan on the cooler is blocking the first RAM socket. So this is absolutely fine if you're only going with two sticks of RAM. If you do want to go with four sticks, you're not gonna be able to use this particular cooler. And in that situation, I would recommend the Dark Rock Pro 4. It's a bigger cooler with fans on both sides, so it will take up more space in your case, and the fans will sit over the top of the RAM. The reason I went for this particular one is we're going with two sticks of RAM, which have RGB on it, so they're gonna look great, and the cooler is not going to obstruct them. And in general, you are actually better going with two sticks of RAM than four sticks of RAM in terms of performance. Then we can go ahead and lower the motherboard into the case, aligning the motherboard's I.O. shield up with a cutout at the back. Once we're happy we've got everything lined up, we can go ahead and secure the motherboard to the case using the included motherboard screws. The next thing for us to do is to go ahead and get our case cables plugged in. They're going to let our front I.O. work. So we've got two USB Type-A ports on the top of the case, and we need to plug this USB 3.0 cable into the motherboard to allow them to work. We've got a single Type-C connector, and this is our Type-C cable which we need to plug in to get it to work. We've got a combined headphone and microphone jack, and we need to plug our HD audio cable in for it to work. And we've also got a power switch, so we're gonna to need to plug this cable in to get that to work. We also got a whole load of connectors for the pre-installed fans. So we've got three of these four pin PWM fan connectors. We're gonna to need to plug them into our motherboard to allow them to work. And we've also got the ARGB all connected up into one cable. Um, we've got two buttons on the top of the case which will let us control the ARGB, but we can also let our motherboard control it if we plug in this three pin five volt ARGB connector to our motherboard. As well, we've got two additional connectors where you can plug additional fans into. We've got this standard three pin five volt ARGB cable we can plug the fans into, but we've also got this three pin connector which is compatible with the Fantex fans as well. So my plan when we come on to install our case fans would be to plug our additional fans into these connectors. Okay, first cable to plug in is our HD audio cable. It's gonna go into this connector down the bottom left-hand side of the motherboard. So we'll go ahead and bring it through the cutout. You'll notice there's a pin missing on the header. We've also got a hole missing on the cable. So we are gonna to need to plug it in with the HD audio text facing down the way. So we'll go ahead and line things up and push into place and then pull the excess cable through to the back. Moving along two connectors, we've got one of this motherboard ARGB connectors. So we're gonna bring our cable coming through from the back, line it up. Remember there is two pins, a gap, and then another pin. So we have to line it up the right way. And then we're just gonna go ahead and push things into place. And then again, we'll pull the excess cable through to the back. Moving further to the right, skipping one header, we've got two PWM fan connectors. So we'll go ahead and bring the cables through, line them up with the header, and push into place. We've got another one right beside this. So we'll bring our second fan through, line it up, and push into place. Plugging in our third and final case fans PWM connector, the cable's a little bit short to reach this header in the middle of the motherboard, so I'm gonna plug it into the one down the far right-hand side of the motherboard. Just to the left of this, we've got our front panel connector header. We've actually only got one cable to plug in. It's for our power switch, and it's gonna go into the pins three and four in the top row from the left-hand side. So we'll go ahead and bring the cable in. It doesn't matter which way this plugs in. I'm just gonna plug it in with the text facing down into pins three and four from the left-hand side. And then we'll go ahead and pull the excess cable through to the back. Our USB Type-C cable is gonna go into here, whereas our USB 3.0 cable for our Type-A ports is gonna go into here. Now, these little covers will slide backwards out of the way, making space for our cable. So we'll just pull them all the way back. 
Okay, so starting off with our USB 3.0 cable, I'm going to bring it through the cutout. Be really careful when plugging this cable in. It's really, really easy to damage the pins in this socket, and I haven't done this before in the past. And if you do damage this header, your front I.O. isn't going to work. There's a little notch, so we need to line it up the right way round. Once I'm happy everything's lined up with the socket, I'm just going to push the cable into place. And then we'll push the excess cable through to the back. We'll go ahead and bring our Type-C connector through, line it up with the header, push into place, and then again pull the excess cable through to the back. This is our power supply. It's what we call a fully modular power supply because it comes without any of the cables plugged in. The big advantage of this is you only need to plug the cables in that you're going to need, which means cable management at the bottom of the case is much easier. So I've plugged in our 24-pin cable. I've plugged in two PCIe cables. Although one cable would power our graphics card, it's got two 8-pin connectors on it, which split into six and two. Um, I have found it better to use separate cables if you've got a power-hungry graphics card. So I've got two of these, and I'm just going to use one connector on each cable. Our CPU has two 8-pin connectors, so I've plugged in two EPS cables to provide additional power to our CPU. And although we're not going to install any SATA drives in the build, we are going to need a SATA cable to power the RGB hub in our case. So I've plugged one of these cables in. I've gone ahead and plugged in all the cable extensions to the black cables coming from our power supply. As I've mentioned, this step is optional. You can just go ahead and plug the cables coming directly from the power supply into the motherboard and graphics card. Um, these do come in other colours than white, so take a look at CCL's website and pick out whatever colour you prefer. And like I said, if you want to save yourself some money, you can just plug the cables to come in from the power supply directly into the motherboard. We now need to go ahead and put our case's power supply bracket onto the back of the power supply. It's these quite thick screws that we're going to use. They are identified in the case's manual. Just before we go ahead and install our power supply into the case, we have got this button labelled hybrid on the back of it. If we go ahead and push this in, it turns on the hybrid function for the power supply, which means if the power supply is under low load, the fan will stop spinning, which will reduce the noise in our PC. Obviously, if the demand kicks up, the fan will start spinning again. So it makes sense for me to go ahead and press this button and reduce the noise in our PC under low load situations. We're now ready to go ahead and install the power supply in the case. It is important that we install it with the power supply's intake fan, which is here, facing down the way. This way the power supply is going to be able to get fresh air from outside the case. So I'm just going to go ahead and feed all the cables through to the front, and then we can go ahead and slide the power supply into the case. And then we can go ahead and secure the power supply into place by tightening up the two thumb screws. We can then make it start of plugging in our power supply cables. We've got our two 8-pin EPS connectors at the top left-hand side of the motherboard. So we'll go ahead and bring the cables through the cutout at the top of the case. Go ahead and line them up with the header and push into place. And then we can pull the excess cable through to the back. Go ahead and bring our second cable through, push it into place, and then again pull the excess cables through to the back. Next we can go ahead and bring our 24-pin cable through this cutout here. We'll go ahead and line it up and push into place. And then we've got some cable combs on the cable we can use to help tidy it up. The final cable for us to plug in is this SATA cable coming from our case. Now this is what powers our RGB hub in the case. So if you don't plug this in, you're not going to be able to control the RGB. So we're going to need to go ahead and plug it into the cable coming from our power supply. So it's just a matter of joining the L-shaped connectors up and pushing into place. Moving on to installing our case fans, they come with these rubber anti-vibration pads. I've already installed them all apart from this corner. It's sticky, so we can just go ahead and pull it off, line it up with the corner. And it'll stick them to the back of the fans. Um, you only need to install them on the side of the fans that are going to be up against the case. These are all going to be exhaust fans, so I've installed them to the rear of the fans. And it's going to help with any vibration noise. The other thing I want to do while we're on the table is take a look at the connectors coming from the fans. So we've got a 4-pin PWM fan connector, like we've already plugged in with the other three fans in our case. We've also got this ARGB connector, which one of the nice things is it is daisy-chainable. So we are going to be able to join the fans together. If I push that one into there, and then our end fan 
is going to be able to go into here. What we're then going to be able to do is plug this into the spur connector we have coming from our case. Okay, so we can go ahead and bring the cables coming from the fan at the rear of the case through to the back. Then go ahead and line the fan up with the back of the case and then we'll get it secured into place using the screws that come with the fan. And then it's the same thing with our top fans. We'll bring the cables through to the back and then we can go ahead and secure the fans into place at the top. And then we can go ahead and replace the dust filter at the top. Then it's just a matter of getting all our PWM fan connectors plugged in. We do have one header just to the left of M.2 slot 1. So I'm going to plug our rear fan's PWM cable into this header. Okay, that's it plugged in. Now what I'm going to do is bring the cable up the side of the fan and through to the back. Then I'm going to go ahead and bring the PWM cable coming from our top rear fan through this cutout and line it up with the PWM header in the middle of the motherboard. Push into place and pull the access cable through to the back. We've got one spare system fan header in the top right hand side of the motherboard. So we'll go ahead and bring our final case fan through and plug it into here. So I'm now going to go ahead and link the fans RGB connectors up together. So we'll join these two fans together. Bring this cable through and then plug it into the fan near the front. So that's our three additional case fans combined to this single connector. And importantly, remember we did have this spur connector earlier on coming from our other lot of fans, so we'll join it together. And that's all our fans connected up. We're now ready to install our graphics card and we're gonna to need to remove the second and third bracket from the top. Next, we need to go ahead and open the clip in the top PCIe slot. Then it's just a matter of lining the graphics card up with the slot. Once we're happy we've got everything lined up correctly, we just need to apply some firm pressure to the graphics card. It's going to clip into place and the slot will close. We can then go ahead and secure the graphics card into place using the thumb screws we removed earlier on. So one of the really cool things this case features is a GPU anti-sag bracket, which you fit on at the back. What I'll do is I'll remove this SSD mount so you can get a better look at things. So you probably can't see this very well, but you can actually feel the two metal bits coming from the GPU here. We've got these little holes, so we're going to try and get the metal bits of the GPU to pass through these holes. Then we've got two holes here, which we're going to secure to the back of the case using some thumb screws, and then that's going to let us support the GPU. So we'll go ahead and slide it into place. So that's the little bracket in place. You can see here it's catching on the GPU and that's going to help support it. And then all I need to do is secure it in at the back of the case using two thumb screws. So I'm going to put the thumb screws on lightly. Then what I can do is slide the bracket to a position where I'm happiest providing support to the GPU. And then I can go ahead and tighten up the thumb screws into place in that position. We're now ready to install the power supply cables for our graphics card. And we're going to bring them through this cutout in the bottom of the case. So we'll slide it back to open it up. And then we'll go ahead and pass the cables through. Okay, so we can go ahead and line the cable up with the graphics card. Push it into place. We'll go ahead and line up with the graphics card and push into place. We'll bring the excess cable through to the bottom of the case. And then we have got these cable combs which we can use to help tidy up the cables. Now these cables do come with one cable comb per cable. Um, I have actually used two on this cable and haven't put any on the EPS cables at the top because I thought that was better use. These are going to be well on display whereas the cables at the top you're not really going to be able to see. So we'll go ahead and slide the cable combs down, tidying up the cables. There we go, and once we're happy the cables look good, we can go ahead and slide the door closed. This now brings us on to cable management, so we need to tidy up this mess of cables so we can get the side panel back on again. Importantly, we do have some Velcro cable straps which are going to help us, and Fantax have included some cable ties as well. 
We've got plenty of space down the bottom, but because we do have a large cutout at the front, it's important we try and bring the cables as far towards the right hand side as possible. We also need to go ahead and close these little clips. So we've got a little thumb screw here. We can loosen, slide them over to the right hand side and then close them. And this is just going to tidy up the cables coming through. So our new build is complete but we have one more step to take before we can start setting up our new PC and that is we need to make a Windows 11 a bootable USB drive. So we need a USB drive with at least 8 gigabytes of capacity and importantly we need to take any files off it that we need because the drive is going to be wiped during the creation process. So I'm going to go ahead and plug the drive into my PC. You'll find the link that you need to go to in the video's description. And we're going to go down to the second option, which is Create Windows 11 Installation Media. And I'm going to click Download Now. Once the file is downloaded, we'll open the Media Creation Tool. Click Yes. We're going to accept the license terms. We're going to need to select the language and edition that we want. I've currently got English, United Kingdom and Windows 11. Um, if I want to change the options, I can uncheck this box and then I'm going to be able to select what I want from the pull down menu. I'm happy with the recommended options, so I'm just going to click next. I want to make a USB flash drive. Um, it already says we need eight gigabytes of capacity. The drive I've got is 64 gigabytes, so we're going to have no problems here. I'm going to click on next. It's going to ask me to select the drive. I've only got one removable drive installed, which is this one here. So I'm going to click on next. And then we just need to let the PC complete the process. Okay, that's just finished. We can go ahead and click on finish. So we're now going to be able to use the USB to set up a clean install of Windows 11 on our new PC. Okay, so I've gone ahead and loaded the Windows 11 bootable USB drive into the back of our PC. And it's now time to flip the power switch and see what happens. So that's a good sign. We've got fan spinning and lights. So we're just going to need to keep an eye on the screen and see what happens. Okay, so we can press F1 to run the setup or F2 to load the default values. I'm going to press F2. So that's good. We've got the MSI logo. Next thing we're looking for is the Windows logo to appear, which will show it's found our bootable USB drive in the back of the PC. There we go, we're through to the Windows installer screen. What I'm going to do now is show you how to install Windows 11, but to make it a little bit easier, I'm going to switch over to the screen mode. Okay, as we go through the next lot of screens, I'm going to pick the options that are relevant to me. If different options apply to you, you should pick the ones that are relevant to you. I'm also going to speed up in between each of the steps. So I'm from the United Kingdom, I'm going to go ahead and click Next. I'm going to click Install Now. So if you've got a Windows product key, you can go ahead and enter it here. If you don't have one, click I don't have a product key. Select the version of Windows you're going to get a product key for in the future. I'm going to select Windows 11 Pro and click Next. I'm going to accept the terms, click Next. And I'm going to go for a custom installation. So you can see our two drives are showing up. We've got our fast Gen 4 drive and our slower Gen 3 drive. So we're going to want to install Windows on the Gen 4 drive. So I'm going to click Drive 0 and go for next. So again, this next step will take a little bit of time, so I'll go ahead and speed it up for you. So I'm from the United Kingdom, so I'm just going to go ahead and click on yes. 
And again, yes for United Kingdom keyboard layout. I'm gonna skip a secondary keyboard. Now I do have an ethernet cable plugged into the PC, but obviously because we don't have any drivers installed, it's not able to pick it up. So I'm gonna to have to click on, I don't have internet. And then I'm gonna click on continue with limited setup. I'm gonna type my name in, click next. And then I'm gonna to have to create a password and then set up three security questions. I'm going to let apps use my location, click yes, accept. I'm going to use find my device, accept. I'm going to send only the required data, accept. No syncing. No. No. Okay, that's Windows 11 installed, but before we do anything else, we're going to need to get connected to the network. So as you can see down here, we don't have a network connection despite an Ethernet cable being plugged in. So we're going to need to go ahead and install the drivers before that's going to work. But obviously, because we can't get onto the network, we're not going to be able to download the drivers from this computer. So I have used another computer to download the drivers to a USB drive, and I'll go ahead and get them. And obviously, I'll show you where I got these drivers from later on. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Auto Run. We're going to install drivers and software. Click Yes. Click Next. We're going to accept the license terms and click Next, Next, Install. And then we can go ahead and click on Finish. So now if we go ahead and hover over the bottom, you'll notice we have got internet access. The first thing I like to do is get Windows fully up to date. So we'll go ahead and click on the Windows icon, click on the Settings. We're going to then click on Windows Update. So what you'll see is Windows has found a whole load of updates here, so I'm going to go ahead and click on Install Now. So what Windows is going to do is going to install the updates. We probably are going to have to restart our PC a number of times, but we're going to keep coming back here and checking for new updates, and we're only going to move forward when there's no more updates available. Okay, so that's Windows fully up to date. Whenever I click on Check for Updates, there's no more updates available. The next thing I want to do is to get all of our drives showing up, because the chances are if we head over to this PC, only our Gen 4 drive is showing up and we need to get our Gen 3 drive to show up as well. So we go down to the search bar and we're going to type in Disk Management. And the Create and Format Hard Drive Partitions is going to come up. So we're going to click on that. So when we open this, we're going to get a little pop-up. It's find our other drive, so we're just going to go ahead and click on OK. So our other drive is showing up as unallocated space. We just need to right click on it and click new symbol volume. Click next, next. It's going to assign the letter D. If we want to change that, we can do so from the pull down menu. I'm happy with D, so I'm going to leave it at that. Click next. And then if we want to name the drive, we can. So I'm going to call it games. And click next and finish. <laughs> Okay, so we can go ahead and close this down. And what you can see now, we've got our two drives now showing up. We've got the local disk C, and we've also got our D drive, which is called Games. Okay, next thing for us to do is to get our drivers installed. So we're going to head over to our motherboards page on MSI's website. Don't worry about getting the link noted down. You'll find it in the description. So we'll click on the Drivers tab. We're going to go down and select Windows 11 64. I'm just going to expand these. Okay, and we'll have a look at the drivers we're going to install. So we're going to want the Bluetooth driver, we'll download that. The Intel network drivers are what I have already installed, so I went over to this page on my laptop and downloaded it and put it on the USB drive, so we can skip this one. And we're also going to want the Wi-Fi drivers. We're going to want the chipset driver. We're going to install the management engine and the serial I.O. drivers. I'm going to skip the RAID drivers and the VGA drivers because we've got a dedicated graphics card. I'm not going to use the inbuilt graphics in our CPU, but I am going to install the audio drivers. Okay, if we head over to our downloads folder, and what I'm going to do with each of these drivers, I'm going to right click and go extract all. Extract. Okay, so we can go ahead and delete the compressed folders. And we're going to go ahead and install each of these drivers one by one, starting off with the chipset driver. Click Yes. Click Next. Accept. Install. Mm -hmm. 
and we're going to have to restart our computer, so I'm going to go ahead and do this now. Okay, we'll install the Bluetooth driver. Click yes. Next. Next. Accept the terms and next. And we'll just go for a typical install. Install and finish. Okay, we'll install the management engine. Click yes. Next. We'll accept the license terms. Click next. Next. And finish. The serial I.O. Click yes. Next. Accept. Next. 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 And again, we're going to have to restart our computer, so I'm going to do that now. Click finish. Okay, next we've got the Wi-Fi drivers. We're going to click on Run. Next. We're going to agree to the terms and conditions and install. Yes. And finish. And then last driver to install is the audio drivers. Click Yes. Next. And again, we're going to have to restart our computer, so we'll do that now. Okay, so that's all the drivers we're going to install from MSI's website. We are going to need drivers for our graphics card, but we're going to get them from NVIDIA's website. We can either just download the drivers or we can install the GeForce Experience. I prefer to install the GeForce Experience, so that's what I'm going to show you. We're going to go ahead and click Download Now. We'll go ahead and open it. Click Yes. We're going to agree and install. And then we're going to have to sign in with our NVIDIA account. If you don't have one, you can create one. So I'm going to put my details in. So we can see it's already found and downloaded a game ready driver for us. If we use our PC mostly for content creation, we can download the studio driver. Um, I'm going to be using this for mostly for gaming, so I'm going to stick with the game ready driver. So I'm just going to click on Express Installation. Click Yes. Okay, so that's the drivers installed. We can go ahead and click on Close. The next thing we're going to want to download is the RGB software. So we're back over on our motherboards page on MSI's web page, but this time we're over on the Utility tab rather than the Drivers tab. So we're going to scan down to the MSI Center and we're going to go ahead and click on Download. We'll click on Open File and click on the MSI Center. Click Yes. OK. Install. OK, we'll go ahead and click on Finish. Then if we go ahead and open our apps and look for the MSI Center, we can click on it. We're going to have to scan down through the terms. We can click that we've read them all and click OK. Click Yes. And then we can click on Start Now. I'm just going to head and skip this. And then if we scan down to Mystic Light and click Install. So we can go ahead and open Mystic Light. And then we're going to be able to use Mystic Light to control all the RGB in our build, apart from the lighting on our graphics card. Importantly, because we have plugged the ARGB connector coming from our case into the motherboard, it's going to let us control the lighting on the fan and also the case lighting. Um, our motherboard itself doesn't have any RGB effects on it. So at the moment, we have selected all LED sources, which includes all the LED connectors on the motherboard. Um, and at the moment, we're currently set to rainbow. What I can do here is I can go in and change the rainbow. Say I wanted to go for a solid color, I could click on steady. And if I wanted to change it to white, I can drag this all the way to the top and click apply. And what you'll notice then that all the lighting on the fans and the lighting bar in the front of the case have changed to white. If I wanted to do the same thing to our RAM, I can click on it. It's picked it up and it's currently set to rainbow. So again, if I want to go for a steady color, I can click on the steady, drag it all the way to white, and click apply. And then we've got our RAM also set to white, and I actually think it looks pretty good in white. So like I say, at the moment, we're able to control all the lighting in the build using this software apart from the graphics card. So if I show you the graphics card now, 
So if you take a look at the graphics card, you'll see it's currently still set to rainbow. So we're gonna to need to download some different software to get it to change color. Okay, so we're now over on our graphics cards page in GameWords website. So we head down to the tool section and we're gonna go ahead and download expert tool. We can click on open file and click on the setup. We're gonna to need to extract all, extract. Then we can double click on it and click on the install. Click yes, click okay, next, 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 install, and finish. So we can go ahead and open the program. So we're gonna click on the expert tool, click yes. So we can see we can adjust the settings on our graphics card. What I'm gonna do is click on the lighting tab so we can see LED control is currently turned on. I'm gonna go ahead and click on still, and then we can select the color. And again, I want to change this to white. So I'm gonna drag this all the way to the top. And what you'll notice now, if you look at the graphics card, all the lighting has changed to a steady white. Um, the other option we have, if we want to turn the lighting off, we can simply click on off and you'll notice the lighting on the graphics card has now turned off. I'm gonna leave it on a steady white, so we'll turn it on and we'll go for still. So as you can see, we can control all the lighting in our new PC using the software. We have got two buttons on the PC. We've got one for mode, which if I press, nothing happens, and one for color. If I press again, nothing happens. And the reason for this is because we have plugged the ARGB connector into our motherboard. If I unplug the cable, we will have control of the case fans and the lighting on the case itself using these buttons. Importantly, we won't be able to change the RAM and we won't be able to change the lighting on the graphics cards. So I'll go on ahead now and unplug the RGB cable from our motherboard. Okay, so that's us onto the solid colors. If I press the color button, it'll let me cycle through the various colors that we have on options. We've also got the option to cycle through the various modes. So if I press the mode button, and then again, for any of the modes, again, we can press the color and cycle through the different options for each of the modes. If I go ahead and hold the mode button, the lighting itself should turn off. And then if I go ahead and press it again, the lighting should turn back on again. So there definitely is some good effects with the hardware button. And if you don't want to install the software, you have a good option here. I'm going to go ahead and plug the RGB cable back in and use the software to control the lighting. Okay, so that's our RGB software set up just the way I want it. What I'm going to do now is head over to the BIOS. Before I do that, I want to download the latest version of the BIOS from MSI's website. This time we're on the BIOS tab and I'm going to click on download. I'm going to remember which version it is. So it's version 10. So when we go into the BIOS, if we have an earlier version, I can show you how to update it. So we head over to our downloads folder. What we're going to do is we're going to extract the BIOS file and click on extract all and extract. So I'm going to right click on this and copy and then go to our external drive and you can see the network drivers I installed on it earlier on and we're going to paste it here. So now to enter the BIOS we need to go ahead and restart our computer. So we click here, click on the power button and go for restart. Now whenever our PC goes blank we're going to start pressing the delete key and this is how we're going to enter the BIOS. Okay, that's the screen black. I'm now starting to press the delete key. And that's us into the BIOS. Okay, so the first thing I'm looking at is the BIOS build date. And actually we have got the latest version of the BIOS already installed. So I'm not gonna be able to show you how to update this today. Um, first thing I want to do is enable the XMP profile on our RAM. So we click on the memory tab and it's found our two sticks of Kingston RAM, and they're currently running at 2400 megahertz. We can see we've got two XMP profiles. The top one is 3600 megahertz, so I'm gonna go ahead and enable profile one. Next, I want to click on the fan info, 
and then we go ahead and click on the settings tab. Now, one of the things I'm noticing at the moment is the PC is actually quite loud. I've recorded a noise level about 30 centimeters away from the closed temper glass panel, and it's around about 41 decibels at idle. So we are gonna to need to make a few adjustments to the fans to get it running a little bit quieter. So taking a look at our CPU fan, it's got the speed picked up as zero revs per minute. I think that's because it's running so low. Um, it's in PWM mode, taking the temperature off the CPU using smart fan mode. Um, so you can see our CPU's temperature is currently 41, so it's only going to be running at 13%, which is the reason why I think it's not picking up the speed. If, for example, I was to go over to here and change this to 50%, our CPU fan speed should pick up, and you can see it's now detecting the speed. So it was running okay before, but it just wasn't picking up the speed. So I'll go ahead and put that back to 13%. Because when I listen in in the PC, it doesn't sound like it's actually the CPU fan that's causing the problem. It sounds like it's the system fans, which are quite loud at the moment. So we've got nothing plugged into our pump, so we don't need to worry about it. We'll go over to system fan number one. It's currently running in DC mode. It is a four pin connector, so we can put it onto PWM mode. And we can go ahead and enable the smart fan mode, which means it will run off the fan curve. So it's currently taking its temperature source off the CPU. The only slight problem with this is as the temperature of the CPU goes up, as it will do when you're gaming, all the fans are gonna ramp up and ramp down, which can make the whole PC quite noisy. And this is one of the common mistakes I think people make when building a new PC. Um, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change that over to the system temperature. So the PC won't be jumping up and down quite as much when the CPU heats up. Obviously I'm gonna do some thermal testing and check that this is appropriate. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna change all the other fans over to match this profile. You can see there, this is definitely running a little bit quieter now than what it had been doing previously. And you can see all the other fans are running much faster. So we'll go ahead and repeat this for the other system fans. Okay, so with those changes made, the PC is definitely more comfortable to sit beside. We're down to 35 decibels from 41, so we're saving a six decibels at idle. And like I say, the PC is much more comfortable to sit beside. The only slight downside of this is the system temperature is going to take much longer to heat up than the CPU temperature. The advantage is the fans won't be ramping up and down all the time, but we need to be careful to make sure our PC doesn't overheat. So I am going to do a bit of thermal testing later. I'll test out this configuration, and if I'm not happy with it, I'll make some adjustments and make further recommendations of what you should be doing later on in the video. So we can go ahead and close this down. The last thing I want to do in the BIOS is head over to the Advanced tab. I'm then going to click on the Settings. We're going to go to Advanced and PCIe Subsystem Settings, and I'm going to enable the Resize bar. Click Enable. Okay, to save our settings, all we need to do is click on the X button at the top. It's going to give us a summary of everything that we have done while we were in the BIOS, and if we're happy with it, we can click Yes, and the PC will boot back into Windows. The first thing I want to do in Windows is check that some of the settings we have enabled have actually been turned on. So we right click on the Windows icon and click on Task Manager. Then we're going to want to click on More Details. We're going to click on the Performance tab and then click on Memory. So we can see our memory is running at 3600 megahertz. So that setting has been enabled. Next thing we want to do is click on the NVIDIA settings. We're going to click Agree and Continue. And then we're going to click on the system information. And if we look, resizable bar has been enabled. So moving on to the benchmarks, all games were tested at a resolution of 1440p on an ultra wide monitor. So that's 3440 by 1440 with graphic settings set to high. So starting off with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, using the game's built in benchmark, we had an average frame rate of 74. Moving on to Far Cry 6, again, using the game's built-in benchmark, we had an average frame rate of 97. Moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and again, using the game's built-in benchmark, we had an average frame rate of 133. In Fortnite, we had an average frame rate of 221, while in Watch Dogs Legion, again, using the game's built-in benchmark, we had an average frame rate of 93. If you prefer playing in 1080p, you can see those benchmarks on the screen now. In terms of temperatures while gaming, these were excellent. Our CPU stayed in the 60s to the 70s, while our GPU was in the 50s to the 60s. 
So moving on to a more demanding test, on the screen now you can see the temperatures and noise levels both at idle and during a 10 minute IDA 64 stability test with all components in the system being stressed. So as you can see, this was a much more stressful test with our CPU reaching a maximum temperature of 102 degrees and there was significant thermal throttling during this test of up to 18%. The GPU temperatures were still pretty good during this at a maximum of 67 degrees, while noise levels were excellent, only increasing by 3 decibels from the idle noise levels. So the fan configuration I showed you earlier on was pretty extreme and was optimised mainly for noise. And if you're using your PC just for gaming, this would be absolutely fine and you'd have a really pleasant experience. If you were going to use your PC for more demanding tasks, you might notice some thermal throttling as indicated by the demanding IDA64 stability test. So the next thing I wanted to test was putting all our case fans back to their stock fan curve and having them react to the CPU temperature rather than the system temperature. Running the tests again, this didn't make any difference to our idle temperatures, but our noise levels at idle increased by 6 decibels. During the IDA64 stability test, our CPU temperature came down by 8 degrees and there was only up to 2% of throttling noted for a short period of time. Our GPU temperature came down by 1 degree, but this improvement of temperature did come at a cost and that was noise, with noise levels increasing by 11 decibels up to 50 decibels. So I wanted to test one more configuration which would hopefully give us a quiet PC at idle, but prevent throttling under load. So you can see the fan curve settings on the screen that I went with for all our system fans. In all these tests, I haven't altered the CPU fan curves at all. So with this particular configuration, I was able to match our first set of temperatures and noise levels at idle, while under the IDA64 stability test, our CPU temperature was only one degree hotter at maximum, but no thermal throttling was noted, and we got similar noise levels to that of our second configuration. So I think summing up all those results, our BQAT CPU killer does a good job of cooling our i7 provided it gets enough air coming from the case fans and you just need to balance the amount of air coming to an acceptable noise level. But hopefully the different configurations I've tested will help give you an idea on how to set up your own case fans if you do follow this build guide. So I've been really impressed with this particular build. It runs brilliantly, they play in the games on 1440p on my ultra wide monitor, they're lovely and smooth and looking great. And it's great having the PC sitting beside me, I think it looks great, particularly with all the lighting set to white, and it's nice and quiet with the air cooler on it. So I'm absolutely delighted with this build guide and I can definitely recommend that you follow it. And once again, a big thanks to CCL Computers for sponsoring this build guide. So if you have found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.